I'd like to discuss the notion of the political in relationship with architecture. And I would like to do so from a particular perspective that is um, the one put forward by a contemporary uh, scholar and architect, Pierre Vittorio Aureli, whose work is entirely focused precisely on this relationship. Architecture and architectural form with politics, or better, with the political, so with the form of politics. And since the aim of the essay is not to provide an outlook on Aureli, but to use his work as an entry point to the question of the political in architecture, I will focus here on only one of his books, uh, perhaps his uh, most well-known one, uh, which is The Possibility for an Absolute Architecture, which is published in uh, 2011. But uh, before uh, stepping in the contents of the book, I would nevertheless like to begin with a, a quote from another context in order to characterize the, the position that uh, already takes in regard to what could commonly be understood as the relationship between uh, architecture and the political. Um, Aureli writes, although I sympathize more uh, with the social ambitions of the architect as activist than with the uncritical celebration of the city as a, more, uh, as a mere conglomerate of complexities and contradictions, I believe that both still underestimate in good or bad faith the power of architecture, even in its traditional format, as a discipline concerned with the design of buildings to influence the reality of our human condition. And this is a quote uh, worth mentioning, I think, for it in, in it already takes distance from uh, two very common positions concerning the role of the architect and of architecture when considered under a political point of view. So on the one hand, already distancing himself from the celebration of the status quo, so uh, from uh, what we could define as some sort of a neoliberalist attitude that would not only let things run as they are, but even enthusiastically and, and critically elevate them as the standard to follow. But at the same time, while sympathizing for the opposite pole, he also refuses to conflate the figure of the architect with one of a political activist, so of someone that takes a clear partisan position in the political arena and that wages fights based on uh, such a position. And not because there is something wrong with it, or what they define something wrong with it, but because the power of architecture, as he calls it, has to do with something that goes beyond both of these positions. And this is precisely the topic of uh, his book, The Possibility of an Ar Absolute Architecture, as you see here. But then, why absolute? So what is this uh, about? Uh, we usually associate that word uh, with power, as for instance in the absolutism of French monarchy. And the absolute evokes, therefore, a sense of uh, limitlessness, of being unconditioned, completely free to do whatever one wants to, and in that sense also a lack of responsibility, so a power that needs n not to respond to anything else above it. Absoluteness uh, therefore often embodies a kind of uh, vertical freedom, we could say, a detachment from a common ground, as well from any Grundgesetz. Nevertheless, once again, one should refrain from associating the term with a commonsensical understanding. So. The term absolute, Aureli writes, is intended to stress as much as possible the individuality of the architectural form when this form is confronted with the environment in which it is conceived and constructed. I use absolute not in the conventional sense of purity, but in its original meaning as something being resolutely itself after being separated from its other. In the pursuit of the possibility of an absolute architecture, the other is the space of the city, its extensive organization and its government. Absolute is then to be understood as something separated. Separation involves a rather horizontal gesture, so what is separated can in fact still lay on the common ground. Architecture must be separated from its other, the city, but the two must still be able to coexist. Separation does not entail an annihilation of what one is separating from, and this would rather be the sense of purity and purification. Nonetheless, already does not title this book uh, the possibility of a separated architecture. A separated architecture would require to assume the common ground upon which the separation is performed to be pre-existing to the separation itself. In other words, it would assume the givenness of a whole that can be split up into in parts. And this is something that uh, already wants not only to avoid, but to counter. Architecture must then be absolute something that, after being separated, can be still uh, resolutely itself. 
The architecture that I already proposes cannot be subjected to a given whole. It must be detached or uh, absoluta as the literal meaning of uh, the Latin word term um, points to from any pre-existing ground. Why? Because precisely by detaching itself from a given ground, architecture is able to constitute a public ground. In other words, it is precisely by separating itself from the space of the city that architecture is able to constitute what already calls an idea of the city. The very condition of architectural form it writes is to separate and to be separated. Through its act of separation and being separated, architecture reveals at once the essence of the city and the essence of itself as a political form, the city as a composition of separate parts. And in this light, architecture articulates what he calls a paradox. Architectural form, already states, is the act of separation and being separated. It is therefore at the same time agent and matter of separation. It separates as much as it is separated, it enacts as much as it receives it. This paradox is the one that already defines of a unilateral synthesis. So if the city can arise only as the other to architecture and through the separation enacted by architectural form, then the coexistence of the two, what, we, what he calls the unitary interpretation of architecture in the city, can only be synthesized from within architectural form itself. Architectural form constitutes the limit within which the city can be conceived in a similar way to which, for someone like uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, language constituted the limit of philosophy. But with a major difference, is if for Wittgenstein the word was is everything that is the case, and therefore whatever can be formulated, the city is precisely uh, its opposite, what emerges in between the cases, whatever figures out of a definite form. As the other to the absolute architecture, the city can only be brought into presence and so it can be spoken, so to say, and to keep with uh, Wittgenstein's vocabulary, via its negative form, so the one defined by uh, architecture. And why is this uh, important? So why is Aureli not content, not happy with the status quo of the city? And why does architecture need to be invested with the task of reconstituting it, of giving it a new language, so to speak? So Aureli's point is that the city as such does not uh, properly exist anymore. There is perhaps a language of the city, we could say, but it is not a public one, it is not civic. The speech that governs the space of the city is rather an implicit one. Implicit and non-public, our relationship to such a speech can only be then a subjective one. So like in speech itself acts as a, an imperative language rather than a declarative one. In such a space, so the one left, by, uh, the one left vacant by the absence of the city as a civic domain, the citizen is then not really a, freely, a free individual, but rather a subject to the invisible and imperative code this imperative code that already ultimately identifies with the one of capitalism replaces architecture and the city with design and urbanization. Both the idea of architecture and the idea of the city, he writes, as defined through the categories of, of the formal and the political, are mobilized against the ethos of urbanization, the managerial paradigm that within the rise of capitalism has characterized our global civilization since the twilight of the so-called Middle Ages. Urbanization is here understood according to Ildefonso Cerdas initial use of the term as the ever-expanding and all-encompassing apparatus that is at the, basis, at the basis of modern forms of governance. These modern forms of governance consist in the absorption of the political dimensions of coexistence, so the city, within the economic logic of social management, urbanization. So materially internalized and embodied by urbanization and by its managerial paradigm, as he calls it, the logos of the city, the speech of the city, we could say, turns into an ethos, into a custom, a habit, and therefore into something preliminary to the public, conditioning it, but also somehow invisibly present and operative in it. The space of the city taken over by urbanization has to be reclaimed by the city through architecture and through the possibility of an absolute architecture. A separating and separated, architecture is able to frame the ever-expanding and all-encompassing apparatus of urbanization, as I already defines it. But before outlining the strategies of such a framing, a picture of urbanization, so to say, must be evoked. 
and let's unseal the Fonster Dot plan for the expansion of Barcelona, Ludwig Gilbert work uh, on um, the Metropolis, um, uh, or the Grofstadt's architecture as he calls it, and then uh, also um, Archizoom um, Nonstop City uh, and um, Rem Cola Cities of the Captive Globe. So all of these projects are um, what I would like to describe as uh, scenographic dramatizations of the code inherent to uh, urbanization. Their representations and models of that uh, managerial paradigm, so of that ethos, able to internalize the logos of the city and to occupy its space. Since there cannot be an exhaustive representation of the city, urbanization cannot be captured, so to say, through just one picture. Each of these examples, each paradigm, models urbanization in a different way, and I highlight it at different aspects of it. The reduction of the city to an economic paradigm, its non-figurative character, the dissolution of architecture into a Hegelian bad infinity, the exacerbation of differences, these are some of the accents given by already to these paradigms in order to characterize or to stage, so to mettre en scène, the prismatic ethos of urbanization in its complexity. In these dramatizations, architecture plays what I would like to call a scenographic role, since it tries to make visible the different plots, the blueprints in colored terms, or the ethnographies in Vitruvian ones, in which the contemporary metropolis is written, so to say. In doing so, they cast a certain hypothesis or a presupposition concerning the work you know, of the plot, the, modus, the underlining modus of its writing. And they do so by acknowledging that architecture is not responsible for the city anymore. In fact, in the age of urbanization, we could say, architecture cannot properly exist anymore, if not as what Collins would have called as a retroactive manifesto. So architecture becomes a sort of uh, Freudian interpretation of uh, the dreams of urbanization or of its nightmares. The task of architecture is then to disentangle them from the unconscious and, as the best therapist, bring them under the light of awareness of self-reflection. The architect can indeed decide how to phrase the plot. In no way, though, can he access uh, the mythical or subconscious level in which the plot itself is weighed. Examples such as the one by Hilbersheimer, Archizum and Kolas highlight these very conditions of the archi architectural aporia by putting the architectural project and this, uh, at the center of their dramatization. And they are, in this perspective, projects on the project itself, so a sort of mise en abîme, or perhaps examples of what uh, Manfredo Tafuri would have called proje a project of crisis. And while the space of the city is taken over by urbanization, architecture and its project are replaced with design. I really stresses this difference between architectural project and design, two terms that today seems almost as interchangeable with each other. He writes, this book does not argue for the autonomy of design, but rather for the autonomy of the project, for the possibility of architectural thought to propose an alternative idea of the city, rather than simply confirming its existing conditions. The difference between the idea of the project and the idea of design is crucial here. Design reflects the mere managerial praxis of building something, whereas the project indicates the strategy on whose basis something must be produced, must be brought into presence. In the idea of the project, the strategy exceeds the mere act of building and acquires a meaning in itself, an act of decision and of judgment on the reality that the designing or building addresses. So if design is concerned with a uh, production, um, the terms and conditions of which are already framed, the project is what defines and questions this very framing. The project is an act of framing in itself. It is not a mere development on the basis of a given program, but it involves the level of programming itself, the subconscious level of coding, so to say. And this level is precisely the one of the possibility of an absolute architecture, as described before, so as an act or de of decision and judgment on reality. And the project is what grants to architecture that possibility of separating and being separating at the same time. In other words, the project is the instrument able to articulate uh, 
that paradox of a unilateral synthesis that is so constitutive for the conception of architecture that already is fostering. A central reference for Reddy's claim is the work of uh, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. In particular, um, Aureli focuses on the recurrent use of a plinth in each of the projects of the German architect. The plinth, Aureli writes, introduces a uh, stoppage into the smoothness of the urban space, thus evoking the possibility of understanding urban space not as an ubiquitous, pervasive and tyrannical, but as something that can be framed, limited and thus potentially situated as a thing among other things. So the plinth enacts precisely that movement of separation and at the same time of lifting up that is at the core of Aureli's conception of the absolute. By establishing a limit, the plinth is able to frame the all-encompassing space of urbanization from within. By doing so, the formerly invisible code that governed the city, so the ethos of ur urbanization, is forced to come forward as a thing among other things. In other words, urbanization becomes graspable as an object, reified. The plinth is what allows to give it a face. The task of architecture, he continues, is to reify, that is, to transform into public, generic and thus graspable common things, the political organization of space, of which architectural form is not just a consequ the consequence, but also one of the most powerful and influential political examples. And the paradigmatic project of this gesture is represented by uh, the Seagram building. Mies here uh, refuses to occupy the entire area of the plots with built volumes and sets back the skyscraper in order to make space for a plaza elevated here on a plinth. By, making room, uh, by taking room in the organizing plan of the metropolis, so in its iconography, the plinth is able to give urbanization a face. The facade of the building itself, enveloped in curtain walls and eye beams, becomes a manifestation of these forces of production of that same ethos that stood behind urbanization. By doing so, these forces leave the invisible domain of the ethos and are drawn back to the public one of a logos. It is, it is the silence, uh, to phrase it again in uh, Wittgenstein's term, introduced by the plinth, invites to speak what appeared as unspeakable and has to be left unspoken. It is as if architecture is unable to give back the word to the city. The pattern of Mies architecture appear as an attempt to alphabetize, so to say, the space of the city in order to master the dominant barbaric noise of urbanization. Mies Late's projects, writes Aureli, absorbed the reifying forces of urbanization, but presented them not as ubiquitous but as finite, clearly separate parts. So, through the project, architecture is able to invert that imperative character that is embedded in the language of urbanization and open up as a possibility for uh, what we could call a free speech, so a declarative language, not an imperative one. While design is a sort of scenographic rendering of a given plan, Aurelis' reading of the architectural project introduces an orthographic depth to this uh, translation uh, process. It questions its grammar and he proposes alternative ones. The space of the city acquires an orthography, but not in the sense of a correct way of writing against the wrong one. The orthography of the city that I would like to put forward as a key to Aurelius' work is indeed the uh, objectification, the verification, and therefore the making of, a, of public domains, of a res publica, of the code in which the space of the city itself is written. What, is making pub what this making public entails is indeed the possibility of changing, of questioning, or reframing the code. By separating and uplifting itself from the ground, architectural form materializes then a state of exception, so an emplacement within which the rules of language are open to discussion and alteration. I really borrows this term, the one of a state of exception, from Karl Schmitt, who famously proposed the exception, so the Ausnahme Zustand, uh, as a determining index for political sovereignty. Aurelius' absolute architecture engages with this sovereignty, and it does so not by occupying its place, but by leaving it vacant, open, public, while at the same time giving it a finite form. Um, so, yeah, so 
If Miss Blint is perhaps the most uh, representative example of such a publicness, it is not so isolated. Aurelius book collects different cases in which uh, he reads the enactment of this orthographic gesture, as I would like to call it. So Palladio, Piranesi, Boulet, Ungers, OMA. Modern history is crossed by examples of architects that, according to Aurelius, had conceived the possibility of a project of the city or of a grammar of the city, as Aurelius would also call it. Mies' model is differently systematized in each of these projects of the city, and Aurelius introduces them in order to highlight through each one of them different aspects. The autonomy of the project, both uh, from the material space of urbanization as much as from any ideal or ideology that would support it, the expropriation of the means of architecture um, and therefore of the projects from a, a linear logic of necessity and their liberation into a domain of contingency in which contradictions are not to be solved, so to say, but to be articulated. And then again, the understanding of architectural form as what can constitute a state of exception, a vacant place of sovereignty within which the city can be projected within and at the same time beyond the indefiniteness of the metropolis and of urbanization. And ultimately, the coordination of this uh, mise en abime of the city, of a city within a city in an archipelago of island that can frame the indefiniteness and or of urbanization per via negativa. And uh, the, the archipelago, which is a trope that Aureli borrows uh, from an Italian philosopher, Massimo Cacciari, is a way to overcome unilateral synthesis as a paradox and understand it as a possibility of engendering the city as a political domain within the formal one of architecture. An archipelago, Aureli writes, is a group of islands set in a sea that simultaneously unites and divides them. Yet, the archipelago is not just a collection of different parts that share proximity. The form of the archipelago presupposes that its parts, even in their absolute separation, are moved by an absent center, towards which each island, in communion with the others, is oriented without claiming possession of the center. The absent center is the locus of confrontation among the islands. Confrontation is both what attracts the islands towards each other and what separates them, preventing their coalescence into a single mass. Analog analogously, the absent center of the archipelago is the political form of the city, which is continually redefined by the limits, uh, by the limits separation or confrontation of its part, just as the relationship between the islands and the sea is an important aspect of the archipelago. So, as the political form of the city, the absent center of the archipelago uh, in which uh, the absence draws back uh, to that uh, vacant place of sovereignty symbolized, symbolized by the state of exception. Uh, so the absent center of the archipelago is a locus of confrontation. The archipelago is the figure that reveals how the possibility of an absolute architecture is once again not one of a absolute isolation or a purification or a purity, but the presupposition for confrontation, so a dialogue between parts, we could say. The orthographic dimension that architecture introduces is then what is able to give a platform for such a dialogue. In other words, the possibility of an absolute architecture coincides here with the possibility of inventing, and in here inventing in the sense of finding rather than one of creating, and of establishing a grammar for the city. This dialogue, this uh, confrontation as I already calls it, is a place in which to find an idea of the city in its true uh, political understanding. And political is here once again related to polis, the space of confrontation of the many. In Aurelius' words, architectural form can therefore be understood as the index for the constitution of an idea of the city. An idea of the city, so not an ideal city. Something that can be realized only here and now, imminently, not in the promise of a transcendent future. And despite how utopian and unrealistic the notion of an absolute architecture and its possibility might appear, at least at the first glance, as well as most of Aurelius' projects, the ones uh, conceived within his architectural office dogma, which he runs with uh, Martino Tattara, so despite the appearances that a destructive reading or look might induce, Aurelius' project, so to say, is very little utopian and very much a realist one. It brings uh, architecture back uh, to its political essence, not as a politics uh, carried on within a 
predeterminate discourse, so as an activist or a reactionist stance, but as a matter of confrontation of part, so the absolute and the archipelago, and ultimately as what the name of his office, Dogma, suggests. So architecture as a deliberate decision upon the undecidable, a decision which is not private, individual, personal, but that always entails a public dimension, a dimension for which uh, communication is essential. And it is in this light that uh, architecture is what can articulate what I would like to call, as in the title of this present essay, so an orthography, the orthography of the city.